Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our session on travel medicine. And like Chris said, this is going to be a really interactive session. Dan Danielle and I are more than happy to answer um, lots of questions. So if you want to stop either one of us as we're progressing through our slides, please just um, yell out. So obviously you're all fairly interested in travel medicine and um, I hope by the time you go away you'll be as passionate as uh, Danielle and I. So why is travel medicine important? So one of the main reasons travel medicine is important is that there's often outbreaks of disease globally. And you'll have seen plenty of media reports um, about measles outbreaks within Australia, but this is also a real global problem. So in places such as Europe, there's been measles outbreaks of enormous proportion, where the incidence of measles has increased from approximately 25,000 in 2017 to about 80,000 in 2018, so a massive increase. In recent years, we've also seen a changing pattern of diseases such as yellow fever in locations such as Brazil, where the disease has emerged in large urban cities like Rio. Dengue fever, you've probably all heard of dengue fever. That's another disease that's increased significantly um, globally, and a lot of which is now in our region. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which started at about the end of 2013, of course, was the biggest Ebola outbreak in history. And although that uh, outbreak is now over, there's a new outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And despite the use of the, the new Ebola vaccine, that disease continues to spread, mainly because there's lots of civil unrest and, and lots of um, uh, untrust with um, international aid. So there's a lot of resistance from the local communities. You'll also have heard about Zika virus, which before 2007 was only in Africa and Asia. And of course now there's Zika in our region. So another reason travel medicine import is important is that globally we're also witnessing the highest level of uh, people displacement in history. So with countries such as Yemen and Afghanistan, Myanmar, Iraq, um, and there's others, that are constantly in conflict and crisis. So there's a lot of people movement. And as a result, there's a lot of, uh, as there's an increase in, in people traveling uh, to work in a humanitarian environment. And finally, travel medicine is important because of globalization. So the opening of international borders uh, for the fast flow of goods, services, and people. And of course, there's positives and negatives to this. So this graph highlights the massive increase in the overseas departure rate of Australian travellers. So you can see there's been more than a 250% increase, which is just massive. So in 1998, there were 3.1 million Australian travellers departing, and this rose to 11.4 million in 2018. 6.4 million of these people, with these travellers, are visiting countries that are deemed at risk. And those countries are in regions such as Oceania, Asia, Africa and the Middle East and South America. So I'm sure you've probably had travellers to your clinics going to lots of those areas. We know that less than 50% of travellers seek pre-travel health advice and often the ones that do go to their GP, which is why this presentation is really um, relevant today. So from the stats of, of the uh, less than 50% of people um, seeking pre-travel advice, you can actually see that travellers really do have a poor perception of risk. And this is why I'd ask you to be all very proactive in your clinics and have a discussion with patients about any plans to travel. Does anyone have any questions about those couple of slides? So what role can practice nurses play in travel medicine? Well, regardless of the approach, whether a doctor does the consultation, whether the nurse does the consultation, or if it's done in collaboration, which I would assume is probably the, the uh, most common, we have a duty of care as health professionals to provide a high standard of care to our patients. And this includes providing travel health advice that's up to date and accurate. And we'll give you the resources to do this shortly. Nurses are also great educators. We see this in relation to roles such as breast care nurses, diabetic educators, so why not travel medicine educators? 
And nurses really do provide education with every single patient uh, encounter or interaction. It's something that we do naturally. So most practice nurses are already experienced and have a good understanding of vaccination, so that's another reason why we can play a key role in travel medicine. And so it's a natural transition into, uh, into giving travel medicine vaccinations. It also expands on the role of the practice nurse, and that's what I, I was a practice nurse and um, just ended up specialising in this area, as did Danielle. Um, so you might, you know, you can go into roles such as a clinical nurse specialist, a clinical nurse consultant or a nurse practitioner, and you might even be able to implement nurse-led clinics. And finally, travel medicine is really enjoyable and pleasant work. Patients are generally happy because they're going on holidays, so it's, uh, it makes a nice change to sometimes what we have to put up with. So how can nurses be proactive with pre-travel health advice? Well, tell your doctors that you're interested in travel medicine, and you all obviously are because we've got a nice big crowd, um, so that they can refer patients to come and speak to you. Tell the receptionist as well to direct patient inquiries to you. And initiate a conversation with your patients about any potential travel plans. Educate receptionists as the first point of call to inquire when patients contact the clinic. You know, they can ask the question, are you travelling anywhere? Would you like to come and talk to one of the nurses? Um, and also get them to suggest to make a specific travel appointment rather than tacking it on the end of a, of a consultation. Encourage patients to bring their vaccination records with them so it's uh, all well planned. Put signs up in the waiting room to let people know, let your patients know that you're providing travel health services and provide literature around the clinic about travel health risks just to prompt patients. And you can implement a travel health form to streamline the approach and Danielle will talk about that further and um, provide that information. So the principles of, key principles of pre-travel health care, and these are really simple, start early. So, you know, allow four to six weeks so that people can complete courses of vaccination. Allow sufficient time for consultation. So like I said, you know, encourage patients to make a, a specific time so that it's not tacked on, you know, they don't mention that they're happening, you know, they're going to Bali at the end of their um, normal standard consultation. Danielle might talk about um, the time she allocates to, uh, for a consultation. Individualise the advice so every patient is, tra uh, every traveller is different and identify high risk travellers. So children, the elderly, people with pre-existing conditions, pregnant uh, travellers and visiting friends and relatives and we'll talk about them in a minute. Has everyone heard of the group of travellers, visiting friends and relatives, the VFRs? We'll talk about them in a minute. Provide up-to-date information and advice. Uh, that's a, another key principle and again, we'll give you the uh, resources to do that. Encourage personal responsibility for safe behaviour. So um, put it back on the, on the traveller to be culturally sensitive, to think about if they don't ride a motorbike in Australia, why would they go to Indonesia or Thailand and, and think that it's okay to ride a motorbike? safe sex, things like that. Consider the cost. It's no use recommending $1,000 worth of vaccines to a backpacker. Provide written information because often people are overwhelmed in a travel consultation with the amount of information, the verbal information that they've got. So give them some supporting documentation that they can take home and read at a later stage. And always recommend comprehensive travel insurance. And it shouldn't just be... Uh, death and disability, it needs to be repatriate, you know, to cover repatriation. And that's something that's really important. People are always worried about their luggage, but they don't worry about the really important things. So different types of travel present different sorts of risk. So we have resort travel. This may be low risk, but it depends where, the per you know, where the uh, person is travelling to for their resort holiday might be somewhere where like, like Fiji, a fairly common choice, um, but you know, the medical care in Fiji may be fairly limited. People might be travelling with children, so that's a, a factor to consider. It might be adventure or expedition travel, so you've got to think that they're going to be away from medical care, it might be remote, might involve things like scuba diving, 
climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and, and uh, altitude sickness, and that's a whole uh, different conversation. Might be that they're going to Antarctica, that's, you know, more popular nowadays. Or they might be doing activities such as rafting. Then there's the backpacker. So travelling on a shoestring budget, they often are risk takers. Um, and I don't mean to generalise, but it's probably fairly accurate. And that may be in relation to the food um, they eat. They might be uh, more tempted to eat in, you know, from market stalls and uh, where it's cheap. The activities they behave, you know, that they uh, partake in, so they might be tubing or riding motorbikes. They might be a bit slack with insect precautions. School trips. So, you know, now, I know years ago when we had school trips, it was never like what they are now, where there's some great international trips and we have kids going off hiking and building huts in villages and all sorts of things. So they present very... Uh, very, very different risks as well. You've got schoolies. Has everyone heard of the term schoolies or had any schoolies coming to their clinic? So with schoolies, they're often first-time travellers. They're often very naive. They often go to places like Bali and Thailand. They drink lots of alcohol and it's often the, uh, the local brew or rack which can have, you know, people can get methanol poisoning from. They often ride motorbikes. Um, so, you know, there's a, a high level of risk with that group of travellers. Business travellers may be at lower risk because they might be, not always, but they may be because they might be staying in, in good standard of accommodation. They might only be visiting cities. Um, they might be indoors all day at meetings. They might be eating at, at uh, you know, renowned restaurants where there's not such a great risk. The VFR, so they're a really high risk group. So the VFRs are visiting friends and relatives. So they're people who um, may live in Australia and they're going back to their place of origin, their place of birth, going back to visit um, friends or relatives, obviously, and they tend to think that they still have immunity to disease when they don't. So um, I've seen this, uh, I've seen VFRs run into all sorts of trouble. So people travelling back to Africa and thinking that they don't need to take anti-malarial medication because they've already got immunity um, and they've wound up very unwell uh, with illness. And I think Danielle's going to talk a bit more about VFRs as well. <laughs> then there's um, healthcare and medical tourism, which is becoming increasingly popular. So we need to ensure, has the traveller done their research? Have they thought about, about blood-borne viruses? So I can remember we saw a, a young girl going off to the Philippines to have some medical treatment um, or surgery and she'd come in for her hepatitis A and typhoid vaccine, but she, had no, she hadn't even considered hepatitis B. And yet she was, you know, going to have surgery. Expats, so expats, you know, long-term stay, probably or often families with children. They may be conscientious in their um, first part of their stay, and then they may become complacent as they, the longer they live in country. And then there's people who travel for research and education. And I've seen a couple of cases where medical and nursing students have gone on placements to um, areas in Africa and they haven't even thought about what they would do with a needle stick injury if, um, you know, in countries that have a high rate of HIV. So it's really important to um, think about things like that. So this slide just provides some examples. So the Top picture is actually uh, my son when he was about 16 going off on a school trip to do Kokoda. Um, so, you know, when I look back, I think he's incredibly naive. He had probably underestimated, well, he was very fit, but he, I think he probably underestimated the, um, the challenge. Um, so, they need lots of education. The backpackers, you'll see the bottom image is uh, how they serve alcohol at full moon parties. Have any of you had children going to full moon parties? or thought about it yourself. Um, so again, it's often, the, it's often the local brew, so, you know, the risk of methanol poisoning. But they drink copious amounts of alcohol and, and, um, and then there's a, a picture there that I took in Africa, actually, about safe sex, always condomise. So. <laughs> and research and education, and that was... Um, I was working in a tuberculosis clinic. So again, you know, you would want, if people are going off to do research and education, you'd want them to have 
a good travel consultation and consider the risks that they may, may, um, may be presented. So I guess key messages are to understand, for you all to understand the importance of individualised risk assessments and that's the risk assessment of the traveller and of the destination. To identify appropriate travel medicine resources and guidelines and we'll, I'll look at that in the next slide and to develop confidence in your recommendations. So some of the resources that are available, and these are fantastic resources. So the CDC, has anybody had a look on the CDC website? It's so diverse. You can plug in um, which country of travel and you can get fact sheets, um, of what vaccinations are required for, um, for the specific location. The World Health Organisation is very diverse and it's incredible. Um, I couldn't even begin to discuss the range of, of uh, resources from that website. Travel Health Pro, so NAFNAC is a great website and Danielle and I were having a good look through that last night and we found a great e-book on it um, that's fantastic, so we'll certainly be using that. And Fit for Travel is a really good uh, resource. So both, both NAFNAC and Fit for Travel, you can get fact sheets, uh, country-specific travel information. Um, they've got updates about outbreaks. Uh, also, the International Society of Travel Medicine, which Danielle and I are both part of, it's about 110 US dollars to join uh, an annual membership, and there's a special nurses professional group, and Danielle and I are both on the steering committee for that, so we'd welcome you to to join. Um, and it, it's fantastic. There's a great website with lots of resources: the Journal of Travel Medicine, the Journal of Trop uh, Infectious Diseases. Is that right, Jan? Dan? Is it the name of the journal? Um, but lots of lots of information on that website. But it also gives you access to a listserv. So if you have a travel health question, you could ask it on the listserv and you will get back. It's a big community um, email group and it's fantastic because you get the, the big gurus in travel medicine um, internationally will, will often res will, will respond. So it's great. I've learned so much just from, um, from that listserv. So they're the free international, um, well, sorry, international, uh, ISDM probably isn't, isn't free, but um, the free local resources, the Australian Immunisation Handbook, and I'm assuming you would all be using that, and it should be the online version to ensure that uh, you're using the up-to-date, you're ac uh, accessing up-to-date information. The NCIRS, so the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance, that's fantastic, lots of fact sheets, um, if you ever have people moving to your area from another, from interstate, they've got all the vaccine schedules of all the various um, states. It, it's a really great resource. Smart Traveller is fantastic, and I would always encourage that you, well, you should always encourage your travellers to register with Smart Traveller. And I had a really good experience, well, it wasn't such a great experience, but I was in a country where there was some civil unrest, and because I had registered with Smart Travel, I got great emails to say, stay away from this area, stay away from that area. So um, it was really great while I was away. Paid international resources are Shoreland Travax and TropiMed. Um, and I, I know with Shoreland Travax, I think it's about a thousand US dollars a year. And that's absolutely fantastic. You can print out a patient report, a traveller report. So you can put in the country that they're going to and it will print out one for the health professional and one for the traveller, and it will outline everything. What vaccinations you need to give, malaria, maps, yellow fever maps, um, hospital information, security information, everything. It's fantastic. Does anybody have any questions about those? No? All right, well, I'm going to hand over to Danielle, who's going to go through the pre-travel health consultation. Good morning, everybody. Does anybody want to have a bit of a stretch? No, everybody's good. Should we just dive right in? Excellent. Okay. Bear with me just for a second while I get my bearings. Okay, so who can do a travel consultation? 
we can all do travel consultations. So a doctor can, um, a registered nurse can do a, a pre-travel consultation. The key is you need to make sure that you're following a systematic process. So I really recommend uh, that you use a form and that keeps you on track and keeps you making sure that you don't miss anything when you've got your patient in front of you or your travellers in front of you. So, um, and just as an interest, if you have an interest in travel health, so obviously we all have an interest in travel health, um, if you have some knowledge on vaccines or an interest in vaccines, and it's a really emerging field, there's just new vaccines coming out all the time, which is very exciting, and new vaccines being added to our um, immunisation schedule, which is also really good. Um, if you have completed or thinking about doing the immunisation course, has anybody done the immunisation course? Wow, quite, that's excellent. Yeah, if you haven't done it, I really, really encourage you to do it. Um, and if you have, as Caroline said, a desire to always work with only happy people, <laughs> I tell you, this is the golden job, really. <laughs> Everybody's happy. Um, then I'm talking to you. Travel medicine is your thing. So um, a systematic and simple approach. Um, so we've got four key areas that um, I'll be talking about today. We try and keep it nice and simple, but when you're creating a form, and there's many different kind of forms that you can get online, um, just make sure that you're going through everything that you think you need to cover with your patients. Make sure that you're not missing any areas, okay? We're all very good as registered nurses with our history taking, so that also carries over into travel medicine as well. So very simply, it's assess the health of the traveller, so the current health. Assess their itinerary, where they're going, what they're doing, how long they're going, all that kind of stuff. Make your recommendations for vaccinations and medications and all that kind of stuff. And then provide education. So this is a very, very busy slide. So I'll come over this side, or if I come over here, just because I feel, I feel like some people are missing out. So come over this side. So, um, looking at demographics, um, so assessing the, the health, current health of your patients. So, age, really important. You want to be recommending the right vaccinations for the age of the patient. Um, and also malaria medications. It's absolutely ridiculous that you would give doxycycline to a two-year-old. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> Country of birth. So, was your patient born like in the state that you are? So, we're most of us from Australia, so a state in Australia. Um, is your patient up to date with the routine immunisations? Is your patient um, from a different country? You know, have they travelled through your country and then on to another country? Have they even had the recommended vaccinations for your country? Um, and are they a refugee? Did they have the appropriate vaccinations when they came through into your country? So the medical history, really, you're just assessing, are they even fit to travel? And it's not that you'll stand or talk with your patient and say, look, I really don't think you should be going. Um, you want to be encouraging, but you're trying to pick up things that maybe haven't been picked up and then referring on to GP or whoever to make sure that the patient can get themselves fit to travel. Uh, are they, where are we up to? Have they got a chronic condition? Are they being followed up? Um, there's a real big push in the community now to, you know, identify chronic conditions and get these under control. Are they immunosuppressed? Are there vaccines they can't have? Would you give somebody with um, an immunosuppressive condition a live vaccine? No. Um, and are they actively being managed? So in Caroline's slide, she highlighted how um, pe people don't think travel medicine is, is important and they travel without seeing anybody for travel health. So here you are talking to them about fantastic stuff with their travel, but just double check that their health in general is being managed and then refer on as appropriate. So any surgeries, so have they had surgeries? When did they have it? Have they got a spleen? Have they got prosthetic limbs? Um, and how are they going to manoeuvre through their itinerary with any of these conditions? Um, and the, just to cut back to the immunisation handbook has a fantastic <coughs> section on um, vaccinations for people without a spleen. Medications, very, very important. So um, I can't tell you how many times I'll begin a consultation and I'll say, oh, how's your health? Great. Any problems? No. Have you got a regular doctor? No. When was the last time you saw your doctor? Are you taking any medications? And then all of a sudden at the end they've got a stent, they've had a DVT, they've... <laughs> and I look at them, I say, and you're well? Oh, anyway. 
Um, so current medication, so over-the-counter kind of stuff, you need to be very clear. Are you taking any medications? No. And then later on you'll hear, oh, I take antacids for my reflux. You're not going to give doxycycline for somebody with reflux. Anyway, um, and prescription medications. Now, illegal substances, and it's... Nobody ever goes, oh, I use recreational drugs. Nobody does that. So you have to find ways to just get that information out. Um, and on the topic of illegal substances with cannabis oil, oh, that's a, a minefield, but anyway. Um, and potential interactions with other travel medications. So, you know, are they taking something that may interact with an oral medication that you may give? Um, allergies. So any al allergies to food or medication? Very important. Um, and also very important to consider dust, um, pollens and, and animal hair, um, particularly for people that might have COPD or asthma or something like that and they're going to a really smoggy place like Beijing. Have they got their puffers? When was the last time they had an asthma care uh, action plan done? Um, and social situation. So, like, a lot of patients, I'll ask these questions, so are you married, is there a significant other? And they kind of look at you like, why do you need to know? Like, I don't really need to know. But yeah, I do need to know because have you come as a representative for your family, you know, and you're going to go home and say, oh, no, we're fine. We don't really need anything. There's a one-year-old baby at home. No, she said I didn't need anything, so neither do you. No, you need to know. Um, and then so you can recommend that they all come um, and, and see you for the appropriate information. <laughs> Um, lifestyle, so are they active, are they not active, are they a smoker, are they a drinker? It just helps you sort of assess their risk gauge or the level of risk they may take. Um, and any occupational risks, of course, um, with workplaces. Uh, we see a lot of minors um, in my clinic going to very high risk areas. Um, so it's really important that, you're, that, that you ask these questions and that you get a base for where to go to next. And then over here, so we're looking at um, assessing for the itinerary, so looking at the destination, the exciting fun stuff. Asking all the personal history, not fun. Nobody is like pulling teeth. But here, assessing uh, itinerary, very fun. So type of travel, is the person going on their own? Are they going in a group? Is it a family? Um, are they doing a conference and then adding on something spectacular at the end of the conference? Where are they going? Are they going to city areas or rural areas? Um, what kind of risks are there at that area? Um, and it helps you form a clinical judgment for what vaccines you're going to recommend, what malaria prophylaxis you're going to recommend, and what kind of gastro medications you're going to recommend. Just on this, I have a, a patient, uh, a regular patient. He goes away every year. He's nearly 80. And he goes to places I have never even heard of and sits in fields and draws. And I worry every trip it's going to be his last trip. But... He's aware of the risk and you just need to know what activities they're going to be doing and what kind of risk is at the area that they are so that you can give the most accurate, up-to-date information that you can and to make sure you're covering them as best you can. Because people will go anyway. So you just got to be prepared. Um, what else? So what cities? Is the location, uh, what location are they going? Is it safe? Um, oh, we've talked about that, sorry. What is their accommodation? Are they in a hotel, resort, as Caroline said? There's no accommodation style that has no risk. There's always a risk. It's a low and intermediate or a very high or extreme risk. Um, nothing is ever no risk. Backpacking and camping, um, as Caroline has already said, the backpackers tend to take a lot more risks. Um, they want maximum adventure on a shoestring budget. Dates of travel, really important. You need to know how long they're going, what season it will be where they are, and how long you've got with them before they depart. So being aware of, you know, the wet season, the dry season, and, and how long they're going to be there is very important. The activities that they're doing, as Caroline has already said, are they there for a holiday? Are they there for business? Honeymoon always makes me really stressed because they go to Zika areas. Um, medical tourism, which we've talked about. Um, now, volunteering, so anybody had um, that's doing travel medicine had any um, volunteer people going, building? You wouldn't build a building here in Australia. <laughs> Why would you go there and make it? Oh, anyway, um, and paying a lot of money to do it. Um, and religious gatherings, of course, you know, going pilgrims to the Hajj and that kind of thing. And risks, so animal risks, animal bite, animal exposure. 
you think, oh my God, rabies, oh my God, uh, everything. Anyway, um, environmental, so again, getting back to your, um, your patients with your asthma and your COPD. What kind of food, have they got any problems? Have they got Crohn's disease? How will that affect their diet? Or how will that affect their health if they have a flare up? Um, lifestyle and of course young children. Um, young children are risky anyway. So these are, again, you've seen this slide. This is very similar to the one that Caroline just talked about. But in the free uh, international section, um, you'll see there's a, a website called Trip Prep. Anybody using that? No? I really encourage you to have a look at it today. It's fabulous and it's free. <laughs> okay, so again, another busy slide. So education. At some point, you'll be asking yourself, what education can I give my patient? Like, what do I know? You may be thinking, I've heard about deli belly, I've heard about barley belly, but then I've heard more people say, oh, you don't need anything for there. That's safe. Or my favourite, she'll be right. So here's some items we need to consider because they're quite important for our travellers, uh, well-being at their destination, because she won't be right on a five-hour coach trip anywhere with E. coli. Okay, so my, my all-time favourite, mosquito avoidance. So educating your patients on how to avoid mosquito bites. So basically, if the mosquito can't land on your skin, you're not going to get a bite. So light-coloured clothing, long length, flappy, loose, resort wear if you like, um, and insect repellent on all skin that's exposed. If you're staying in air-conditioned environments, that's um, a less favourable environment for mosquitoes, so that's good. If you're not in air-conditioned environments, um, having a discussion with your travellers about making sure that windows and doors remain closed unless they're screens, just to limit mosquitoes flying in for a snack. Um, if there's a fan above the bed, just having it on a low speed because the thrust, downward thrust of air stops mosquitoes being able to land on you and, of course, sleeping under a net. And then the last step, malaria tablets. Food and water. So recommend strategies for minimising travellers' diarrhoea. So the, the you know, key saying, boil it, peel it, cook it or leave it, um, rings very true for nearly every traveller's destination. Um, environmental hazards. So again, contact with animals. I can't tell you how many people I get in my clinic that go, oh, I just love the dogs over there. And I think, have you seen the dogs over there? They're mangy. Anyway. Um, and heat and sun exposure, again, um, being very cautious with the very young and also our more mature, older travellers that can dehydrate faster and, and just get unwell faster. Personal safety, so travel, uh, traffic accidents. So um, Brazil in South America, the highest risk of motor vehicle accidents. Um, anybody tried to cross a street in Vietnam? We had fun doing that. <laughs> How we didn't get run over, I don't know. Anyway, um, water safety, and that's like anybody been rafting in Thailand? I have, I can't believe I did that. What was I thinking? It's so unsafe, but it was fun. Um, and substance abuse. Uh, so, again, getting back to, um, for example, the full moon parties where the um, alcohol is very heavy on the um, methanol component. Um, causing a lot of problems, uh, leading to death, unfortunately. Um, travel insurance, very important, which we've already covered, and also um, patients registering, registering with um, Smart Traveller. Sexual health, so in my clinic, we spend a good few minutes, because uh, we talk about a lot of stuff, talking about sexual health. Condoms, 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 condoms. What is it? No glove? No love. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and blood-borne infectious diseases. Again, so medical dental procedures. I've had patients just whiz through my clinic. No, no, I don't need anything. I'm just going to get a tooth pulled in some dirty old bat place. Why? <laughs> anyway, people will do it. You just need to make them aware of the risk and offer what you can to protect them as much as you can. And again, educate them on the risk, okay? Maybe they're not aware. So I just want to pause for a second here just to mention the recent changes to yellow fever accreditation. Um, yellow fever accredited centres. Oh, there's a lot of you. That's great. Okay, so uh, the 26th of November 2018, um, the new exam, the accreditation process came in. 
for um, everybody who is uh, a current yellow fever provider must sit the exam and pass it. Um, I make it sound really intense, exam. Anybody done it? Sunday just passed or Sunday coming? Good luck, you'll be fine. Um, so it ideally is, uh, anybody, can do, anybody can do it, um, but the guidelines came in for um, doctors and now nurse practitioners such as myself. So the old process was the accreditation was done as a clinic, so the practice was accredited. So basically you filled in your application form, sent it to the Department of Health, someone from the public health unit came out, looked at your fridge and went, oh yeah, pretty good. And you got a tick. And then uh, you got your stamp and then voila, you started doing yellow fever. Now, um, it's, uh, the accreditation is on the provider, individual provider. So um, you must be accredited, so therefore you sit the exam, you do the, the three courses, sit the exam and pass, and then that document goes automatically, I think it's an automated process, to the Department of Health, and voila, you're right. So any GPs, I don't know if there's any GPs in the room, any GPs who are providing yellow fever um, have three years to do the exam. If there's any other nurse practitioners in the room, you must do the exam before you start administering yellow fever. Any questions on that? Okay, so in summary, it's really important that um, we talk to our patients about travel health. It's really important that you identify who your patients are because they may not necessarily make themselves known to you. So having that um, information up in your workplace, having that discussion with your key people that are in your workplace, so your GPs, your receptionist. Your receptionist will be your best friend. They will just refer everyone to you. You'll be so busy. You'll be like, oh, I love you, but just, you know, ah, oh, calm down. You'll be like overrun with patients going um, away for travel. So start slow and off you go, literally. Um, you need to be proactive, basically, is what I'm saying. Each traveller is unique, so you need to provide tailored advice. Not uh, everybody will need, you know, every single vaccine you have in the fridge. Not everybody can afford every vaccine you have in your fridge. Um, so again, following the simple process, so assess the health of the patient, are they even fit to go? Look at the itinerary, is it safe, what risk, what vaccines, all that kind of stuff. Make your recommendations, vaccines and medications. Provide the education, um, and the education, at, when we go through the case studies next, you'll see um, it's pretty straightforward. It's nothing that you don't already know. It's just honing in and fine-tuning what you already know. Um, and if in doubt, refer to specialists. So if there's somebody in your workplace who also is very good at travel medicine, you might refer on to them. Or you might link in and work collaboratively with them until you feel like, you know, you're well enough to stand on your own two feet. As Caroline said before, we both started as practice nurses. Um, we joined an association and we worked with GPs in our, our settings until we were confident enough to be like standing on our own. And, and it will happen. Okay, so case studies. Everybody ready? Oh gosh, we're eating. It's going to be hard to do case studies while we're eating. Come on up. So on the tables, at the end of the table, sort of the, the side of the table on my side, yes, you'll have a form. You have quite a few forms actually. So we have four case studies. If we can, we'll get through all of them. If we don't, don't worry, we'll just get through as many as we can. So this is the form that you'll be uh, looking to complete, but enjoy your breakfast first, don't let it go cold. We can multitask, we're nurses, we do really well at everything. Okay, so we had hoped to do a role play for you, but we weren't sure about the setup of the room, so I'm sorry there's no role play today. Maybe there might be. Oh, we'll see how we go. Um, we're going to talk about, discuss, if you will, um, some travel-related scenarios, and these are very common that we see in our travel clinic, and if you're doing travel medicine, um, they're probably very common to you as well. So we hope that you will be um, stopping us and asking questions or giving us what, you know, your opinion of what you do in certain cases. The more interactive, the better, um, because that's how we learn. And, you know, here we're all amongst our peers. So, you know, that's, that's the best learning um, space, I think. So 
you can either do the fill out these pa pages on your own, or you can do like a group activity with your table. If you haven't met everybody on your table, you want to introduce yourselves, get to know each other. Okay, so the process worksheet is front and back and very simple. Um, it's again just focusing on the four areas that we've already talked about, assessing health, assessing the travel itinerary, recommending vaccinations and providing education. And then we have our CDC checklist, which if nothing else, this is gold. And then over the page, um, trip information that you will ask, for your patient, ask your patients. Okay, so our first case study is a family going to Bali. How often do we see that? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> um, so we have mum and dad, and we have uh, these, I'll explain this in a second, these are some really, really tall twins, okay? <laughs> really tall. <laughs> Okay, so male and female, mum and dad. Now, they are aged in their 30s, early 30s. Um, they are well. They, they're not taking any medications. They're not allergic to anything. There's no significant past medical history, no surgical history. Um, perhaps mum had these twins um, naturally. Um, the vaccinations that they have had. So they've had a DTPA in 2018, um, and that would have been mum's uh, pregnancy one. So she would have had that when she was pregnant and dad would have had his for the cocoon strategy. Um, in 2009, they both had uh, hepatitis A and B full course. They had a typhoid injectable in 2009 and they had rabies pre-exposure in 2009. So they obviously have traveled somewhere required these particular vaccinations. Um, and ordinarily in your travel consult, you'll ask them, so where have you been before? <laughs> um, so they are fine. Now these are really tall twins are 13 months old. <laughs> they just walked right on out of there. Uh, they were born at 38 weeks. They are not breastfed. They are on a normal diet. They're not allergic to anything. And they're up to date with their national immunisation program vaccinations. Any questions about this family? Are we missing? Yes, there's a question. Ah, they are, sorry, what I should have added, these twins were born in New South Wales, so they're up to date on the New South Wales immunisation schedule. And the question was... Sorry, whether or not they're... Sorry, whether they identify as being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander and would be on a different schedule. They are non asti Any other questions? Yes. I think so, yes. <laughs> yes, they're up to date. Always tricky. The female can always say yes, but the male never knows. And that, like, I know that's terrible to say. Sorry, all the men in the room. But um, the men, <laughs> it is, well, it's true. Um, the males didn't start getting the second measles, mumps, rubella vaccination until 1984. So they definitely had one, whether they had two, but very good question, yeah. Okay, so now we've got the itinerary. So we can see they're in Bali. Um, they're starting off in the south, moving right up to the north, coming across, and then finally arriving at Ubud. So we should be thinking about, oh, how long, how long have I got them in the room with me before they go, okay? What's their current health concerns? Are there any outbreaks or risks at the destination? Vaccinations, what am I gonna give? Malaria tablets, what do I do? Gastro packs, do they need anything? Insects, I know there's bitey, itchy, midgy things there. And insurance, something about insurance. What else do we need to know? You can scream it out if you like, yeah. Mm. So, uh, 
I'll just repeat that question. So the, for everybody, the question was, um, will they have, would they have, had they had any serology taken? That would be in your recommendations. So you're jumping ahead a little, but yes, you're on the right path. Yes. Yes. So, so this, that, that question was, what, accommodate, what type of accommodation are they staying in? So this family uh, are jumping all over the place. They're actually doing temple hopping. So they're going to be stopping at a temple or five at every destination that they're going to. Um, so they'll be staying at your three-star kind of accommodation. So potentially no air conditioning, maybe air conditioning that's not working so good. Definitely fans, hopefully screens. So the question was, do we know what time of year it was? What season? What season? So um, the, the patients will be leaving... What are we now? April, May, June. They'll be leaving in end of June. That is a really good question, yes. So that's something we need to discuss with um, mum and dad about that, yes. Oh, sorry. Is mum pregnant? Could mum be pregnant? So that's a really... That's any woman of childbearing age, I like, what's your plan? How are we stopping it? Or are we stopping your travel? <laughs> it's not happening in a Zika area. <laughs> okay, so we'll just move on. So for this family, um, five and a half weeks until they depart, so around June, all family members are well. The mother is not breastfeeding. Really important. We can give contraception. We can encourage contraception. Um, there is an issue with mosquitoes, particularly dengue and chikungunya and Zika at these destinations. So when do these mosquitoes bite? Yeah, correct. Yeah, these mosquitoes are daytime biting mosquitoes, so you need your full force of mosquito um, prevention um, being offered to this family. Very, very important. Um, rabies is endemic at these destinations. So... What do you know of rabies? What are you going to tell these people about rabies? <laughs> what about the dogs, 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 dogs? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, and children are also at risk because they're likely to sustain um, injuries to their face or, you know, the higher area of higher regions mm. of their body. And the risky things with children in rabies areas are that they may be told don't touch or pat the animals and they will do it because they like to challenge us like that. <laughs> um, but if something happens, they, they're worried they're going to get into trouble so they may not tell mum and dad that they've mm. got a bite or a scratch. Mm. And, you know, at bath time you may notice a scratch and not think anything of it. Uh, so it's really, really important. I spend a lot of time with families and probably you do too really encouraging if the children are in the consult saying, you know, it's not safe to touch the animals there. And if you forget and you do pat an animal and the animal nips you, bites you or scratches you, you must tell mum and dad you will not get into trouble. It's really important that you have that conversation so that the children know they're not going to get into trouble um, because they did the wrong thing, um, but that the parents can then make sure that the post-exposure prophylaxis is given because almost 100% fatality rate with rabies. I was just going to digress and say the other group of travellers that go uh, playing with dogs are backpackers. And I've just recently been in Cambodia and, and backpackers are always wanting to feed dogs and pat the local dogs. So, yeah, <laughs> very true. Sorry, that is digressing. <laughs> That's OK. Um, so what kind of risks are posed for these travellers going to these millions of temples that they're going to be visiting? Monkeys. Monkeys and dogs. Um, is there malaria in Bali? Where is the malaria in Bali? There's none. There's, none. <laughs> There's no malaria in Bali, sorry, trick question. Um, this seems like a full-on tour, so uh, let's move down. Sorry, I like to read the same thing twice. Um, are there any other health risks for these people that we need to discuss? Yes, food. Where are they going to be eating their food? What kind of food are they going to be eating? In, on their itinerary, it's a tour, so they may not actually have any control over the food that they'll be eating. Their tour guide will select the restaurant that they'll be going to and the food will be prepared for them. 
So it's out of their control. So again, the peel it, boil it, cook it, or leave it. Um, it's served to you piping hot, and it's um, it looks like food that you could eat. <laughs> it's really hard to tell what's in food and what's not. Um, provided it's served to you piping hot, fresh, probably it's okay. Um, there's a lot of different pharmaceutical products you can purchase before you travel or take with you to have before you eat your food to reduce your risk of traveller's diarrhoea. Um, and of course, there's um, some fantastic drugs that will help you treat traveller's diarrhoea if you were to get it. Um, so travel insurance. Do you want to talk about travel insurance for this family? So you would want to ensure that this family has comprehensive travel insurance and it's really important to make sure that um, the parents disclose any pre-existing conditions. Um, people can get caught out thinking, or they might think, oh, I don't want to pay more for my insurance premium. It's imperative that they do disclose whether they've got... Well, these parents, these actual individuals don't, but um, you just would not travel anywhere without travel insurance. So, so the question is just about travel insurance that's linked to credit cards and I would recommend that people really read the fine print because there's also been a lot of people who say, you know, oh, I've got a gold visa card so my travel insurance is comprehensive and covered. I would check the fine print. And the other thing with um, travel insurance is to, you know, recommend to your travellers or advise your travellers that if they're going to go and do risky things like scuba diving or ride motorbikes, they're not going to be covered by their travel insurance. So unless they disclose that they are, you can get it, but you need to disclose there's often questions about international um, driving licences and mm. ultimately the travel insurance companies will try and get out of... Um, yeah, they're not going to part with money. Yeah. They'll take your money, but they're not going to part with it. Yes. It may not be covered, and it yeah. mean That's absolutely correct. So the question was if somebody um, is intoxicated, is intoxicated, <laughs> or may not even be intoxicated, but has had a couple of drinks, um, the travel insurance may be null and void. And that's correct. Okay. So uh, group discussions. We've covered quite a lot of stuff. So is Zika an issue for this family? Zika is an issue if the mother is pregnant and travelling into a Zika area or planning a pregnancy. So the current CDC recommendations, so they previously were, um, you know, condoms or no pregnancy for six months. Now, because this is a couple travelling, a male and a female, um, it's advised that pregnancy be avoided for travel uh, to Zika areas for a period of three months after leaving the area. And you can see there, there's some fantastic purple shading there indicating Zika in that area and it's very close to us. Ooh. I'm getting a bit nervous. Um, I'll go back. So serology, the question that was asked before about serology, should we consider serology for these people? What kind of things will we be ordering? What kind of serology will we order? So we would like to do uh, serology to test their rabies because they've had the pre-exposure vaccination 10 years ago and um, World Health Organisation new rabies guidelines um, that came out into force last year, 2018, um, indicate that for this group of travellers we would just do a, an immunity test um, to check the serology and um, vaccinate uh, accordingly. So we would also do a serology for measles, mumps, rubella and chickenpox. Now, I didn't include a serology for hep A and hep B because they've got documented doses of the vaccines being given. Sorry, I should have told you that at the start. <laughs> yes? You could, but we're going to do a blood test anyway for the rabies, so you may as well. I like to see the evidence. To be determined by the patient with the healthcare professional in the consultation. But yes, 
Oh, sorry. The question was, so say you did the, the rabies serology and it came back at zero. So they've got documented evidence of three vaccinations in 2009 and their serology came back at zero. What would you do? So that would be discussed in consultation between you and the traveller in the consultation. But certainly if you read the rabies guidelines that were um, issued last year, 2018, it's a clear pathway for what to do. So we're going to take some blood for rabies teeter. Uh, we're also going to check for measles, mumps, rubella and chickenpox. We're going to give a typhoid injection or oral. Um, are people offering both in their clinics? We're going to give a flu vaccine because we don't want anyone getting the flu. We're going to consider Japanese encephalitis. And I say consider because when you're talking about vaccinations like Japanese encephalitis or diseases like Japanese encephalitis, um, you don't, it, you know, what's the saying? The common things commonly occur, the rare things rarely occur. So Japanese encephalitis does occur, but not at a very high rate. So again, looking at uh, the itinerary, yes, possibly they're going to come across um, Japanese encephalitis. Um, and when, what time do Japanese encephalitis mosquitoes bite? Anyone going to have a stab? <laughs> Do you want to answer? Is it daytime? Yeah. A daytime biters as well. Okay. Um, so for this in my clinic, and again, this is just what I do, um, if they're travelling for more than a month, I would really encourage. If they're travelling under a month and they're like at high risk of exposure, so these people are travelling around looking at temples, they're going to be outdoors quite a lot, I'd certainly talk about it with them. Um, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's up to the patient. If they're informed about what the risk is, they can make an informed decision to either deny, like not have the vaccine or have the vaccine or other measures. So if the rabies antibodies are below 0 0.5 international units per mil, then a booster is required, OK? That's the, that's the cutoff level for rabies serology. You can, you can recommend it at any time for any traveller. So with the outdoor exposure, if they're outdoors all the time, they're, they're at a higher risk because they're sitting ducks, <laughs> if you like. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, I think the thing to consider with Japanese encephalitis is while the risk may be low, the consequence of the disease can be really quite severe. So I think, and Chris is probably the expert on um, JE, but, you know... I think it's a third of the people, a third of people with Japanese encephalitis will die. A third will have permanent um, neurological, neurological damage and a third will um, have minimal symptoms. Mm. So it might be low risk but high con severe consequence potentially. Yeah, good question. <laughs> okay, so anybody want to have a stab at vaccines we're going to give? So a few people suggested, I can hear somebody, people saying typhoid, Dan. Oh, hang on. There's a, oh, sorry, we've given vaccines. We're going to move on to the twins. Yeah. Sorry, forgive me. Um, so vaccines for the twins. Oh, yes, question. Yeah. question. Yeah. Um, in regards to serology versus vaccine, <coughs> what's the difference between the two? Because I know that the vaccine Did everybody hear that question? The cost of serology versus cost of vaccine is that in relation to? Oh, in <coughs> Maybe it's to do with your your labs. Um, the labs I use bulk build the test. Oh, really? Yeah, the problem I have is the time it takes to get the result back. That, that's the biggest issue. So if you've got travellers leaving in a short space of time, the bloods, you'll take the bloods and then you may wait two weeks or longer for the result. What labs are people using? What labs everybody using? Northern <laughs> 
might, might be worth having a chat to the provider. Okay, so just have that conversation with your lab and just, because it, we don't have a problem, bulk, it does get just gets bulk billed <laughs> in the labs that we use. So yeah, just have a conversation with them. All right, so let's race through. What are we gonna do for these twins? We're gonna give the hep A. Oh, flu. We're gonna give hep A. There is a brand registered for 12 months um, and there are other brands registered from two years. Oh, sorry. We're going to give a rabies pre-exposure course. And again, this is in keeping with um, the labelled use of vaccines that we have in Australia. So given day zero, day seven, day 21 or 28, there's no upper or lower age limit for giving rabies vaccinations. So you can give it to very newborn babies and you can give it to our more senior members of the community. We're going to give a flu. Every, some people said flu, very good. And if you're feeling really stealth, yes? April. Did everybody hear that question about the flu, flu vaccine? So availability, um, so you're talking about government stock? So this would be private stock because these children don't fit any criteria that... Oh, they will now. They may now. Yeah, so you could do, you could use private stock. Yeah. Sorry, there's two questions. Yeah, yeah. That is true, yeah. It makes it really convenient for our um, travellers now with the extended um, expiry dates for some vaccines, which is really good. Um, now, if you're feeling really stealth, um, and again, this is just based on the New South Wales immunisation schedule, I would give the 18-month vaccinations early to offer protection against varicella. Um, so for those of you that are in a different state with a different vaccine schedule, just have a look and see, you know, can you do it? Is it possible to do it? Um, but I just added on just to be mindful that the interval between dose three and four of um, DTPA, the minimum time frame is six months. OK, so that vaccine would have been given the last DTPA would, would have been given at six months of age. They would have had the new 12 month schedule and then so safe to give. And Dad, maybe that ACER won't recognise it. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Air won't recognise it. The Australian oh, Immunisation yeah. Register. So they may not. Re that will be an invalid vaccine. That's fine. Have that discussion with the parents and just say we're doing it to offer the protection. It will need to be reboosted at the correct age gap. No, age. And that's a really important consideration for expat families travelling. Mm. Okay. So we would also consider meningococcal B, and again have that discussion about Japanese encephalitis. What are we going to do for the parents? Contraception, condoms. Because yes, there could be another pregnancy. They're in their 30s, mum's in that childbearing age group. They have two children that are 13 months. They might feel like having some more. Food and water precautions, very important. Oral rehydration salts for the twins as a first line and have a discussion. Again, depending on which program you're using, so if you're using um, you know, the paid for, the Travax and the Tropi Med, um, though they have information on food and water precautions. They have information on where the nearest hospital is at the destination. They are really fabulous resources. Um, and again, insect repellent, sun cream, all that kind of stuff. Did you want to add anything? No, and just to uh, reiterate com or have a conversation um, about animal um, avoidance, but we've already discussed that. So. Yeah. Um, if you're going to do the meningococcal B vaccination, paracetamol an hour before and then two regular doses at the appropriate time afterwards because we know that vaccine gives you a really sore arm and a really high fever. Uh, we want to give a letter to the patients to carry with um, any medications that may be prescribed or provided to them in your clinic. Um, I have a discussion with all of the travellers that come through my clinic about if they're unwell and they seek medical attention, come and see us when they come back so we can follow them up, make sure that they're looked after. I can't tell you how many... Um, not many times, thankfully, people will come back and they think they've had some kind of exposure or they've got this funny lingering thing. And I think, oh, God, you should have just got off the plane and come straight to me, put up with it for too long. Um, and again, just being um, culturally aware and sensitive and being mindful of your personal safety. And here is a fantastic photo taken by Caroline about 
being culturally appropriate and your personal safety. <laughs> so this lady is really um, walking the edge there. She's outside the safety fence posing for a selfie. Any questions? So the question was, would we give the children typhoid? So the vaccine's indicated from two years and up, so they would not have that vaccine. So the question was, is with rabies vaccination, is it very the timing very specific? So the timing of the rabies pre-exposure vaccinations is on the product information for the vaccine. So we try in our clinic, sorry, we try in our clinic to stick with that schedule. So the schedule is day zero, day seven, 21 or 28. So we try not to deviate too far from that. A lot of clinics, um, certainly clinics Caroline's be at, been at, um, you'll have rabies days where you're just doing, so everyone will go on that day for their rabies vaccination. So you've got patients every week, um, therefore like a day of the week, say a Thursday. Another question? So, so the question was um, whether, uh, in, in regard to intradermal rabies vaccination. So if you read the World Health Organization 2018 guidelines, they talk about intradermal and they talk about intramuscular. In Australia, intradermal is off-label use, so I can't talk about it. So the question is, how long after um, somebody has stopped immunosuppressive medication before they can have a live vaccine? That's a really good question. So that is a, um, a important discussion that you have with the patient specialist because it is dependent upon the medication and the dose that they've had and the condition that they are being treated for. But yeah, that, that's a really, that happens all the time, yeah, probably in everybody's clinic. So yeah, don't be afraid to contact the specialist and have a, a really honest discussion with them about the patient because you're their advocate and you want to do the right thing by your patient. Um, in some cases, there are just are patients that will not be able to receive live vaccinations. Um, so you may have that discussion with them about changing their itinerary. And people that are having immunosuppressive medications for various conditions, they don't want the extra risk. But they're not risk takers generally. They're, they're happy to change their itinerary to avoid high risk areas. Um, and that's been my experience over the last 20 years. I haven't had anybody go, well, no, I'm gonna go there, no. <laughs> Maybe next week someone might do that to me, but <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I noticed that there's been issues around uh, rabies post-exposure um, uh, access to the immunoglobulin. Is that still the case? So the question is about access to rabies immunoglobulin. Do you mean within Australia or no, internationally? internationally? Yes, so that's certainly correct. Um, in lots of countries, rabies immunoglobulin is unavailable. Um, places like Bali often have a good supply, but at the same time they can also, there can also be periods where there is no immunoglobulin and you would have to consider sending somebody to either Singapore or bringing them back to get immunoglobulin. And I'll just add, uh, there's a quick uh, add. So there's human immunoglobulin and there's equine immunoglobulin. And the equine uh, immunoglobulin is much more refined, less um, adverse events. I'd be happy to have it if I needed it but I don't. <laughs> uh, we've got time for one more question. Anybody got a nail-biting question? Oh, yes, one more. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm a nurse practitioner. Yeah, in my scope of practice, yeah, I can. For you guys, you will need to be working in with the GP. You will need the GP. Yeah. But yeah. there's nothing to say you can't lead the consultation and then the, and the, they see the doctor at the end of it with mm. your recommendation? Hey, yeah. Yeah. We all started off that way, so give it a go. <laughs> Could I just please ask everybody to fill in the feedback form um, that's been put in front of you? And thank you very much for your time and interaction. <laughs>